Welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Discover how to grow your practice with effective cosmetic patient attraction, conversion, and retention advice from author, speaker, trainer, and cosmetic practice business and marketing coach, Catherine Maley, MBA. Hello, and welcome to Beauty and the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of the cosmetic practice. So I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to cosmetic practices to get them more patients and more profits. And just in case you, you want to hear the inside scoop of how podcasts go, this is my fourth try today to do this because what I keep forgetting is I live in Sausalito and it's the summer. So guess what happens? We have seaplanes and helicopters that take off less than a mile away from me. It's, I, I can hear them quite easily. So every time I tried to do the podcast, you know, one would take off. And I said, oh, no problem. Now that they're gone, they'll be gone for at least 30 minutes. Well, sure enough, then like, let's say that was the seaplane, then the helicopter took off. So I guess it was a very busy day today, um, you know, with the tourist thing in the air. Um, by the way, though, if you ever come to Sausalito, definitely do a helicopter or a seaplane tour. They're really fun and you can get just killer views of, the, uh, of Northern California. So anyway, let's talk about today's episode, and the topic is easier path to new cosmetic patients. Doesn't that sound great? Wouldn't you like an easier way to get to new cosmetic patients? So before we get to the easier way, let's go ahead and start with the harder way to get new patients. So not too long ago, the only way you could really do it was with TV and radio and print ads and billboards, and there's nothing wrong with that if it still works in your community. Now, in some areas, it still works. I will say not many, but it's, you know, you have to take a look at where you're at. The thing that I don't like about TV and radio is that it takes just a ton of repetition to get even get any attention. And then to get somebody to act, it's a whole other feat. And it's very expensive. And the thing about TV and radio is you can't segment it like you want to because they'll, they'll give you shows or they'll put your commercials on shows that cater to your demographic, but you're still just wasting a whole bunch of uh, eyeballs that are never going to want any of your services. So I don't love that. And the thing about magazine uh, magazines, I think those are definitely a dying breed. Um, you know, you can maybe it still works. I do like the social magazines and I like the top doc magazines, but I only like them <laughs> to use them as marketing pieces and as PR. So things like as seen in top docs magazine, I think there's some value to that. And then of course there are the billboards. Those are pretty expensive. Um, I've, I've, te- I've looked at those before uh, for certain practices and um, there's actually a couple practices out here in California that do pretty well with them, but it's not cheap and they're up year after year after year. So people just get really used to them because here's the thing, you want them on a really busy highway, but then they have to stay put because you want people to see them every day, all day, start thinking about it. And it could take them a year or two before they actually call. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So, so the whole issue with, with all this mass advertising is it's very difficult to target who you want to target and it's tough to get attention. So then we move on to PPC, otherwise uh, adoringly called Google AdWords. And uh, a lot of you have horror stories about Google AdWords. Here's the thing about that. You better know what you're doing or work with somebody who does because you can go through an awful lot of money very quickly and not even realize what happened. I know I tried it once for my business and it was just, I lost $500 in a blink of an eye and I still don't exactly know what happened because I had no idea what I was doing. So you really want to um, be careful with that. And don't just be lackadaisical. You have to really work with somebody who knows direct response copy and knows how to write compelling words that get the consumer to click on your ad. But then don't just haphazardly send them to your homepage. That's not where they want to go. A cosmetic patient who clicked on an ad, let's say for eyelid lift, that's another thing. Do not call it a blef, a blef or a plastic. They don't know what that is. You have to call it what they would call it, the consumer. So you would call it an eyelid lift. 
But then when they click on your ad, it better go to an eyelid lift page talking about eyelid lifts with before and after photos of eyelid lifts, testimonials from patients who had an eyelid lift. Um, what else? FAQs about an eyelid lift. And then, of course, on that page, you have to have an opt-in that asks for their name, their email, and their cell phone. And then that's all I would ask. I think some of you ask way too many questions and it turns consumers off and they just leave. And then, of course, let them call as well. So anyway, here's the point. Pay-per-click is expensive and you never know. Um, you never actually know what's going to happen because you're bidding with your competitors. If you have somebody in your area who spends a bucket load of money on PPC, you're almost better off, you know, watching when they're not doing it and then jump in because otherwise, you know, you may never be seen if you can't, you know, um, compete with somebody with a huge budget is the point, unless you're dying to one up them is the point. But here's something else that's really interesting. Did you know only 3% of people clicking on and uh, Google AdWords is actually ready to buy. Isn't that interesting? I mean, wow. So think about that. All of you, I mean, a, a lot of plastic surgeons are just spending a fortune on PPC to try to get attention from those 3% who are actually ready to buy. That's really tough. So some of you said, okay, forget PPC. It's too expensive. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do social media right? So now the thing about social media is it's not taking up a ton of your money yet, but it is taking up a boatload of your time. You also, if you're going to play that game, you've got to get pretty creative with your post. You've got to be tech savvy and you've got to be able to interact with people who are talking to you. I mean, that's really brutal because you're also supposed to be a surgeon and a leader and managing your team and running a business. And then you're supposed to interact with every little, you know, Sally who wants to ask you a silly question. So you have to figure that out. Um, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but the social media sites are very quickly strangling your reach because they need you to pay to play. So have you ever noticed that you used to follow somebody and now you don't see them anymore? And that's because they're deciding. I think nowadays, and I'm guessing on this, but I, I know I heard something like only about 10% of your audience is actually going to see you. And if you want more of them to see you, you have to pay. And that means start doing ads. So it's just going to, it's just going to be like the other platforms. It's just a different platform. So right now you're giving money to, let's say TV, radio, or billboard. Then you gave money to PPC. Now you're just going to give money to Facebook or Instagram. There's no getting around that. Advertising will always be around. That's just the way we do it. We live in a world where there's a marketplace of goods and services, and then there's a group of consumers, and the supply and demand will always dictate how much advertising costs and how much you're willing to pay to get in front of new patients. It's just the way it is. But here's the thing, if you, and because most of, most of everybody has to play these games, you know, you have to advertise uh, a lot more now than you used to have to just because of the competitive nature. But then you have to deal with the quality of the leads. I know, I hear this all the time. Oh, they're crappy leads. They're not even serious. Well, that could be true. But what else is true is you better have staff on their game who can really convert. You can't just have anybody answering that phone. You've got to have somebody who really knows how to ask for the appointment. Um, also, you have to set up parameters. The, the, um, I just know the public will run you ragged uh, when you're trying to cater to them. So you have to have some boundaries and uh, make sure the no-show issue doesn't get out of hand and try to qualify as much as you can ahead of time so they're halfway serious when they get there because there's nothing worse than spending all this money sifting through all these leads to spend time nurturing them for them to show up and then spend your time with them, educating them on your services, and then having them not convert. I mean, it's just, doesn't that wreak havoc with your emotional state? <laughs> so, all right, so that was the bad part. 
So now let's talk about the easier path to new cosmetic patients. And of course, what I'm talking about is the friends, the family, and the colleagues of your current patients who love you, who know you, who trust you. And all they have to do is talk about you to their friends, family, and colleagues. So they too will know, like, and trust you. That's your lowest hanging fruit. That's also your leverage. If you think about it, you already spent a fortune of time, money, and effort getting the current patient you already have. So why not expend some of that effort in making that grow? Because here's also an interesting stat. On average, all of us have a circle of influence that expands to at least 250 people. So think about it like this. If you have a database of, let's just say, 2,000 patients, and you put some creativity and effort into that, can you imagine if each one of them only referred one of the 250 people they know, you would double your database. Isn't that crazy? So sometimes it's easier to look within than to seek without. I mean, seek outward. <laughs> Here's what I would recommend you do just to, just to bring this home to you. Go ahead and pull a report. And by the way, if you can't pull these reports, you need a system where you can. It's that important. If you pull a report called Revenues by Referral Source, depending on what the categories are that you set up, it will be called something like word of mouth, friends and family, patient referrals or staff referrals or physician referrals. And by the way, I recommend you decide on the categories and keep them separate, but you don't need all of these different ones because a lot of times when I'm looking at reports, Somebody will tell me this was word of mouth, but then it turns out when I keep looking, one of them, one of you called it word of mouth, somebody else called it friends and family, somebody else called it patient referrals, <laughs> and you have to get consistent with that so you have good data to follow. You also want to know a really important one, and that is existing patient. That's the one who loved you, gave you money, loved their result, and came back for more. That's what we're looking for. So, but you want to know all of that. So it's called revenues by referral source. To give you some context and a benchmark, here's a very general overview. If you're a new practice, I mean, let's say one to 10 years, your word of mouth should be about 30%. If you're an established practice, let's say 10 to 20 years, your word of mouth should be about 50%. And then if you're well-established, your word of mouth should be 70% or more, okay? It's just a, something to go by. Because here's what I know for sure. The straightest point, or I'm sorry, the straightest path between a new patient and you is always going to be their friend. It's their friend talking with them face-to-face, -face, talking and bragging about how great you are, and talking and, and getting them to go to you. There's nothing cleaner than that. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's easier, and the best part is they usually convert. I mean, what better review or social proof can you have when a girlfriend's talking to a girlfriend and she says, my God, you look fantastic, what have you been doing? And sure enough, she says, well, let me tell you my story. And she says, of course, well, who did that? And, uh, and you're off to the races. So now the rest of this time, let's just talk about how we're gonna do this. And in the old days, you used to just wish or hope or expect or assume or feel entitled. Of course, people are going to come to you. I have to tell you, in today's world, nobody is thinking about you ever. All they're thinking about is themselves. So you need to be creative and focus on this. The more you focus on this, the more often they will talk about you to their friends. So here are just some simple strategies. Number one, when somebody walks into your office, there needs to be in-house signage in strategic places, and it needs some copy such as, the greatest compliment you could ever pay us is to refer our practice to your family and friends. I was actually in a practice where the surgeon had that very statement because it's a popular statement, and it, it makes sense. The greatest compliment you could ever pay us is to refer our practice to your family and friends. He had it painted on the wall near the checkout, above the checkout, so, I'm sorry, the check in and check out counter. So, when you walked in, the very first thing you saw was that. I thought that was kind of neat. It was kind of in your face, but uh, very effective. 
Also, on your patient intake form, most of you use a very generic form that says referral source, and that's it. Some of you get fancy and say, please tell us how you heard about us, and then you give them options. One of the options is always, you know, a, a place for a friend's name or a current patient's name. If they fill that in, you need to have another blank next to it that says, may we thank them, question mark, and then have a yes or no so they can say yes. If they say yes, there should be a protocol that immediately happens because sometimes people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I refer you, I refer you all the time. Oh, yeah, I refer you constantly. But you never see anybody from them. This way, there's a control document. When they say, yes, Sue Smith referred me to you, you immediately have at your reception desk thank you notes with colored envelopes, with stamps, maybe even with a gift card, which I highly recommend, or a Starbucks card or some kind of little gift. You put that together, you handwrite the note and keep it very simple. Hello, Susan. Thank you so much for referring Susan to us. We're going to take great care of her. And then you put a little gift card in there, you address it, and you put it in that evening's mail. You don't wait. You don't collect them. You make them happen immediately because I'll tell you, um, people never get around to this kind of thing. It's the little things, and, I, and, I, and trust me on this, it's the little things that are not efficient. They're a pain in the neck. You have to stop what you're doing and handwrite things. That's where all the secret sauce is. I, I promise you on that one. Um, people really notice when you take time out of your day to do something that takes your time, you know? Um, I'll tell you what you don't want to do, and uh, I've seen it happen way too many times. Somebody's got that computer-generated form that says, thank you so much, and they plug in the person's name, and you might as well not even send that. If anything, I find that more insulting than, than anything else, so don't even bother. Another one, also at the uh, checkout desk or even at the check-in desk, you want to have a referral display with cute little takeaway cards. And again, some kind of message that says the greatest compliment you could ever pay us is to refer our practice to your friends and family. And then please take a few cards, you know, on your way out. And the thing I like about this is if it's at the checkout counter and the consumer, you know, the cosmetic patient opens her wallet and she looks over at this sign, she'll go ahead and take a couple cards and put them in her wallet. And you really want this, you want to be walking around with her with her, in her purse. <laughs> and that's because in her travels, and we don't leave, we don't go very far without our purses or at least our wallets. Um, when the subject comes up and then they want to talk about you, it's just a step even further where they have your, like literally, they have your name and your website right in front of them. And they can, it's a prop that they can pass off to their friend. Um, some of you have tough names or your uh, website names are tough. Um, or people just can't remember. So it's really nice to have that paper trail. Now, I do make this a gift card. It's called a referral reward card, or it's called a get to know us gift card. And it has a value of $50 to $100. Now, I know some of you are tied with the fee splitting thing. So we never have a tit for tat. I've called many boards to find out what are the rules on this. And I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't get caught up in all of that. It's just the, the rule is you cannot pay for a referral. So there's no tit for tat to this. They can refer or not, but they're not getting paid for it. However, it would be nice for you to make sure you thank them. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, let's say um, the people, you have the referral cards there, but people aren't taking them. So at that point, you want to proactively hand them a couple cards along with their receipt for the day. And just say something like, nice like, oh, by the way, I gave you a couple of referral cards. We'd love if you pass those out. Just something very simple. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't push it. But give them the tools to help talk about you throughout the industry or throughout their travels. Now, you can also do something fun like Fun Fridays. And the staff can wear cute T-shirts that say, ask me how you can save $50 on your next appointment. Or they can wear lapel pins that say, we love referrals. Wouldn't that be fun? You can also have a brainstorming session with your staff. Everybody gets together and they relax. You need a minute to do this. And somebody's writing down everything that's being said or you record it. And the question is, who do we know? You know, who do we know that could know us? So you just go right down the line. 
It's their friends and family. It's hair salons they go to. It's health clubs they work out at. It's retail shops they shop at. It's media outlets that they happen to have connections with. Perhaps it's mom's groups. Maybe they're a mom and they have a mom's group. Or maybe they belong to the Chamber of Commerce. Or maybe they belong to some kind of a hobby group. Or maybe they're really involved in fundraising. The point is, you all know a lot more people. Remember, we all know at least 250 other people. If you were to brainstorm and start thinking of all the connections you have, that could be just what you need to get the ball rolling. Now, in case you want to make more fun out of this, you could actually have a friendly staff referral contest. So you would give the staff cute little referral cards, you know, like the $75 Get to Know Us gift card, and there would be little initials on there so you know which staff person, you know, was responsible for the referral. And now you have a contest for 30 days. And in the staff room, you have a grand prize for the most referrals, and it's a big grand prize. It's like a flat screen monitor or an eye watch or a huge shopping spree. I mean, you make it a big deal. And then you also um, give like second prizes of lesser value to those who um, participated but then didn't win. And by the way, if somebody doesn't participate, that's a really good indication that they're not part of the team and you want to take a look at that. Now, in addition to that, you could also, let's say you don't want to do that. Let's say you want to do something simpler. So now you could have just a simple staff event and you would take an evening. And if it goes well, you know, you can do it several times, but you have one evening or one day or just block some time, depending on, you know, how busy you are. And you tell your staff that all of their friends and family are invited to your special evening where they can get procedures done, or day, they can get procedures done for a really good price. However, in it, because of the great price they're going to get, they have to agree to uh, provide their before and after photos, uh, give you a great review, and write a video uh, testimony, or uh, do a video testimonial, and also write like a testimonial about their story so others can read it. So that's the point. It's going to be a great evening of just friends and family. They get a great deal, but they're going to have to work a bit for it. I hope that makes sense. And speaking of staff, the next time you hire staff, you might want to find out if they're bloggers or if they're, you know, big on Instagram, like how big a, how big of a follower list do they have? Um, can they bring any clients along with them? Can they, like, listen, especially if they're an esthetician or some kind of service provider, um, can they bring a Rolodex with them? Do they have any connections with the media? I mean, really take a look at that when you're hiring people. Um, sometimes they can come with a nice list for you, and that gives you a great bump, you know, quite easily. Um, you can also just network within your neighborhood. A lot of you are in huge buildings where there are plenty of other service providers who share the same demographics you do. So I would just say hello to them. Now, you have to be careful because um, this feels like a sales call, doesn't it? If you start walking around and knocking on doors, um, I wouldn't, I would get your friendliest staff person. I would give them cookies. Um, you know, this has to be really fun. It's just like, in, um, you know, when you buy a new house and somebody comes to the door with the cookies and welcomes you to the neighborhood, it's kind of like that. No sales, no pressure. You're just saying hello. You have some cards and you want to invite them down. To, or, or write them down or up or next to your place. Um, you want them to come and you can even offer them like um, at lunchtime, if they can get away, you, you serve lunch to the doctor and their staff. So your staff gets to know their staff and you get to know the other service provider. Um, it can't hurt at all. And if they're right there in your neighborhood or close by, that's your best bet for referrals. Now, regarding surgery, I personally believe in sending a gift while somebody's recuperating. I do like the idea of flowers. Uh, some people send uh, food, but when you're recovering, it you're in a pretty down state. I don't know. I, I've had you know several uh, surgical procedures, and I plan to have more. Um, but it's not fun. So it would be fantastic if some flowers arrived, and 
you called that night to see how the person's doing and then leave a message if that, you know, if she can't come to the phone and then of course have your staff call after that. How, if you did that, if you sent flowers and you called that night to check in and then your staff called other nights to check in, tell me they wouldn't tell their friends. I mean, that's a good story because how many doctors do this in today's world? Zero. I shouldn't say zero. I know maybe three and I know an awful lot of practices. It's not popular because it's one of those things. It's not automated yet. It, it takes some t trouble to do this. You ha it's a hassle. You have to make it part of your protocol. I think it's well worth it. You send flowers for what? 50, $75. Wouldn't you pay all day $75 for a 10 to what? You know, $20,000 surgical procedure. I would. Now, another thing that comes up is after surgery, when they're ecstatic, about the results. You need to grab that. The timing on that is crucial. So you have a goodie bag waiting for them to return to your office because you need to take their after photos. Everyone gets the before photos, but then they don't get the after photos because they haven't made a protocol. So after surgery, when they're really excited, not a year later, nobody's excited them. It's already become, you know, their body at that point or their face. They don't remember anymore or as well, and they don't have the emotional charge that they had. So when they're super, super excited, you invite them in for their goodie bag, and in their goodie bag are tchotchkes. And I don't know how to spell or say tchotchkes, but it's things like a t-shirt with your logo or a water bottle with your logo. And I, whatever it is, I would make it very high quality, uh, you know, the, the gifts that you give them. And then also you can put in there your skincare. You can also uh, put in there um, a gift card for some kind of treatment after surgery um, to now introduce them to other services you offer. But then you've got to include their before and after photos in a thank you note. So here's what I would do. You know how you take before and after photos? I would somehow get them instantly. Um, you know, I don't know, print them out, you know, have some kind of photo printer there. And then put their before and after photos in a thank you note that goes into their goodie bag. And in the thank you note, it's hand signed by all of you. Again, it's a pain in the neck and well worth it. And it also has your name and your website on there and your Instagram and your Facebook. Okay. And then guess what? She's going to show it to at least three of three other people. I guarantee it. A woman, a female woman is not capable of keeping a secret. <laughs> That's for sure. And she will definitely tell at least her sister or her best friend or her neighbor. Um, trust me on that one. So that's in the goodie bag. And then I would also include like VIP comp cards. So you now, because she's now kind of like a VIP patient, she can pass out complimentary consultation cards for her friends to also see you for surgery. And then, because I, I assume or I hope you're charging for a consult in today's world because it's such a big, you know, no-show issue. And so right on there, you would say compliment a complimentary consult thanks to Sue Smith um, so you can also track those. And then lastly, all of those strategies are fantastic, but here's the real secret sauce. You have got to thank anybody who does anything nice for you when it comes to growing your practice. So whenever you do get a referral, you send a personal note, you personally call them, you send a little gift, uh, maybe you offer them a complimentary treatment, maybe you call them in, or the next time they're in there, you give them a little extra Botox, a little extra filler, a little extra laser on an extra body part. The whole point is behavior that is rewarded is repeated. So you'll get a whole lot more referrals when you show your appreciation. Um, I actually asked patients about this in my book, and they wanted to feel appreciated. You know, quite frankly, we all do. Everybody wants to feel appreciated for doing something nice for somebody else. So just please don't take it for granted. Make sure you, you say thank you. And that will wrap that up tonight. Um, please uh, subscribe to Beauty and the Biz. I'd really, really appreciate it. I'd also appreciate it if you would share you know, beauty and the biz with your friends, your staff, your colleagues. Also, please um, send me your comments and your questions and uh, any guest ideas you have, because I'm going to start having guests on as well. 
And then please check me out on Instagram. I'm at Katherine Maley MBA because somebody took Katherine Maley, so I had to add MBA at my end at the end of mine. Okay, I hope that was helpful, and I will talk to you again soon. We hope you found valuable insight on this episode of Beauty and the Biz. For more episodes, tools, and Catherine's free book, visit www.catherinemaley.com. That's www.c-a-t-h-e-r-i-n-e-m-a-l-e-y.com. And be sure to subscribe to get the latest practice building strategies delivered to you. And don't forget to share this Beauty and the Biz podcast with your staff and colleagues.